This picture is on dating, the etiquette of dating. We are going to follow some of these students as they go on a date and see if their manners have anything to do with their fun. Everyone thinks that his own manners are all right, even if they aren't perfect, and that being correct only helps to spoil fun. So let us compare what these students do and don't do with what we think is right. Let's compare ourselves with Margaret, or with Helen, or with two fellows who are particularly interested in them. The junior prom, a semi-formal, is the best dance of the year and is announced early. Jerry is the shorter of the two. He believes that he who hesitates is lost and that the time to ask for a date is now. Margaret, for her part, believes that a girl shouldn't make it difficult for a fellow to ask for a date. Fear of not being asked, or fear of being refused, can ruin our social lives if we let them. How do you act? Natural, at ease, graciously? Or are you shy? Like Frank, do you blurt out invitations? Actually, Helen is glad to receive the invitation, and Frank is surprised. Getting dates is not hard if one will act with a bit of courage and show himself to be sincere. A week before the prom, Jerry asks Margaret to help Frank by finding out what Helen intends to wear to the dance. But Frank isn't thinking far enough ahead to realize that he will soon be selecting a corsage for Helen and that the corsage should harmonize with the color of the dress to be worn. He should also find out the type of corsage she prefers. So Jerry steers Margaret into a discussion of corsages. She recalls the ones she likes best. Gardenias, spring flowers, an orchid once, camellias. She and Jerry have been dating for a long while. She appreciates the good taste he has shown in choosing flowers that suited her dress and complexion. The wearing of flowers on the wrist, the shoulder, or in the hair is a matter of preference. When Frank finally asks Helen about her preferences, she is glad to tell him that she likes all types of corsages and all flowers except gardenias. All the other preparations for their double date are also talked over. The night of the prom, Frank is glad that the dance is semi-formal and that the wearing of a tuxedo is optional. But even with a dark business suit, so Jerry insists, the color of the tie should be conservative. The socks should match the tie, not clash with it. We dress according to the occasion. A dignified occasion requires dignified clothes. As a matter of convention, men wear dark clothing at formal or semi-formal affairs. Thus, perhaps, they allow the ladies, by contrast, to be more colorful in their dress. This tie may not seem conservative by your standards, but it seems to be the mildest that Frank owns. Perhaps for the next dance, he will buy a quieter pattern, something that won't compete with the colors he expects the girl to be wearing. In that sense, he will be showing consideration for her, a gesture of friendliness. And that is what etiquette really is, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Correctness in dress, like other matters of etiquette, is something which has to be learned. One needs to check on himself and inquire from those who know what is correct. Of course, women usually receive more training than men in the etiquette of dress because of its importance to their appearing always to best advantage. But girls have their problems just as fellows do, and what they think is in good taste may not be. Naturally, everyone thinks that what he or she likes should be considered correct. But most girls are inclined to overdress. Even the word of parents is not always accepted. 
mother is called old-fashioned. But Margaret will take Helen's word for it that she is wearing too many ornaments. Simplicity is always the safest policy in ornamentation. Correctness of dress for an occasion includes not only the choice of gown and slippers, but the hairdo and the accessories, the jewelry, and, yes, the face makeup. The rules are simple, logical, and easy to remember, and they are very important. Frank doesn't look happy, and he isn't. But how much of his fearfulness is actually a lack of confidence in his manners? Whether he admits it to himself or not, his unsureness is painful and is already interfering with his enjoyment of the date. His wanting to blow the horn for Helen instead of going into the house to meet her parents and to escort her out is really not shyness, but a sign that his manners are weak. He hasn't taken the trouble to learn how to meet people easily. Helen tries to introduce him first to her mother, who has risen to shake hands with him. Ladies are always introduced first, and they may offer to shake hands or not, as circumstances warrant. Frank forgot that he should present the corsage to Helen at home, so that she may put it on there if she prefers, rather than carrying it to the dance. Notice that Jerry acknowledges the introduction to Helen's mother with a nod, since she elected to remain seated and did not offer to shake hands. Frank shouldn't open the corsage box, but allow Helen that pleasure. Since Helen does not wish to put the flower on now, Frank should take care of it and see that it is not damaged but give him credit for assisting Helen with her rap. Helen's parents are glad to have met the boys with whom she is going out. And on the boys' part, meeting the parents is a minimal courtesy as well as a pleasure. Good manners never interfere with fun. They should be habits. And habits of correctness are just as easy to learn as bad habits. Correctness has the real advantage of allowing one always to be at ease. Jerry has been here often and is right at home. However, the ease with which he enters into a conversation is based on his genuine interest in other people and what they are thinking. Meanwhile, Frank is laboring to interest Helen in what is his, not her, chief interest, sports. Margaret is careful not to keep Jerry waiting. She doesn't believe that keeping a fellow waiting a long time will allow her a more dramatic entrance and thus increase his interest. Rightly, she depends on the charm of her personality to hold his attention, not upon little games. So that Jerry feels he is dealing with her true self at all times. The phone call is from one of those fellows who wait until the very last minute to try making a date. Jerry can laugh at his would-be competitor. Margaret is gracious, of course, but brief. There is no excuse for last-minute requests for a date. No girl is flattered at the idea that she hadn't already received an invitation. Besides, a lot of the fun in dating is in the anticipation. And right now, they are well along in their fun. But Frank and Margaret have problems with conversation. Margaret has tried to talk about the dates she has had with other fellows. She meant only to be entertaining, but such topics irritate rather than interest. Perhaps, she and Frank hope, the dance will furnish better topics. Now they have arrived, and all the fun they hope for lies ahead. Dances are intended for enjoyment, and the rules of etiquette which apply to dances are again customs which have grown out of one person's anticipating the wishes and feelings of others. A gentleman doesn't dash off just because he sees a friend and wants to say hello. He waits as his lady removes her wrap.
allows her time to pin on her corsage and powder a bit if she wishes. He saves her any feeling of being deserted or of possible embarrassment in entering the dance unescorted. Ladies expect and appreciate such courtesies, just as they enjoy the thoughtfulness shown in presenting them with a well-chosen corsage or enjoy being properly escorted. In meeting their hosts and hostesses, Margaret isn't always as aware as she should be of Jerry's attempts to escort her smoothly. And if Frank realized that his awkwardness, in contrast to Jerry, is due to his not being sure about introductions, he would learn the simple rules in a hurry. Introduce a man to a woman, a younger woman to an older woman, a younger man to an older man. The name of the person to whom deference is shown is always mentioned first. The person who is to be introduced waits until the introduction is made, and then waits for the other to offer his hand. Only a few friendly remarks are made. After greeting the sponsors, the first thing that Jerry sees to is that they select a rendezvous so that they will have a definite place during the evening for meeting after dances. Then they begin filling in their dance programs. When programs are filled out in advance, and then one or two couples don't attend after having exchanged dances, the programs are left with gaps that are hard to fill. So it is perhaps better to wait until dances can be exchanged with those friends who are present. Then the dances that have been promised can be written in. The purpose of the program is not to exclude others, but the opposite, to plan for exchanging as many dances as possible. In that way, everyone dances with his friends and makes new friends. It is not a mark of affection for a couple to try dancing the entire evening by themselves. For after a while, they tire of their exclusiveness, and then each one fears to hurt the other's feelings by wanting to dance with someone else. It is customary, though, for a couple to reserve for themselves the first and last dance. Frank forgets it and has to be straightened out. But now that they have gotten to dancing, let's hope that their troubles are over and that the evening will work out the way they have hoped. However, let us watch to see if their enjoyment depends in part, at least, on their manners. All that they ask is that they be allowed to talk and to dance, to be with their friends, and enjoy each other's company. yourself as you fill it, then present it. Getting jealous? They're only enjoying themselves. Frank, be sensible, Margaret. Frank, you're wrong. She hasn't lost interest in you. It's foolish to be jealous. you're spoiling. As 
the dance is drawing to a close, and it is time to say goodnight to the sponsors, everyone seems to have had a good time, except Frank. The dancing hasn't worked out as he and Margaret hoped, but Jerry and Helen are at fault too. They have allowed Frank and Margaret to become jealous. Of course, they aren't justified. Margaret made the mistake of trying to be too entertaining. Frank allowed his fears to make him wooden. People never like to blame themselves, so they blame others. All that either needs to do is to learn how to be natural and talk of what is interesting to the other person as well as to himself. Meanwhile, a good deal of the fun has gone out of the evening. Even though Margaret pretends that nothing has happened and all is well, Naturally, we all learn through experience, but that is usually the long and the hard way. We can learn much faster and save ourselves from being hurt so often if we realize that our social lives are filled with problems of etiquette and that these must be studied. We must observe our own behavior, compare it with what is proper, and be certain that our habits are correct. Jerry's example in suggesting to Margaret a dish that she might like is one that Frank might follow. As he finally realizes, since it tells Helen in a nice way how much he can afford to spend. This saves embarrassment all around. At last, Jerry is becoming aware that Frank and Margaret are not having a good time. He doesn't ignore the situation but brings the problem out into the open. Margaret and Frank are forced to admit their own foolishness. After all, Helen and Jerry had simply been at ease during the dance and enjoyed themselves. They hadn't been any the less interested in their partners. There was absolutely no reason for jealousy. You notice that Frank is becoming more alert. He orders for Helen correctly. And maybe we can hope that he has decided to turn over a new leaf. This way is more fun. The meal has been happy. And now that everyone is happy again, the date is moving along as it should. The mistakes that have been discovered won't be repeated. And those that haven't yet been discovered will come to light as they pay more attention to their manners. But already they have learned some valuable lessons, Frank particularly. He has learned to begin with that he shouldn't let his fears stop him from asking for the date in the first place, and that he should ask right away, not fret about it. He is glad now that he learned a little more about selecting a corsage and about how he should dress. He has still to learn how to be easy during introductions and in making ordinary conversations. But you saw that he was quick to pay the bill, including a 10% tip, and that he found it pleasant to help Helen with a wrap. On the way home, there are no problems. They are happy in knowing that this is just the beginning of happy times ahead. Jerry not only sees Margaret home, but opens the door for her. And then, well, they've been going steady for some time now, and there are some customs that are very enjoyable. But now Frank has a new problem. Should he try on a first date? He makes certain that he helps Helen from the car correctly. She waited properly for him to come around the car. He sees her to her door and thanks her for having gone out with him and he remembers to open the door for her. No, he should not try to kiss her goodnight, not on a first date. But he does ask her for another date soon. Helen is quite happy to accept, so their first date is a definite success. Our ending is only a beginning of other dates to follow, of a new attitude toward manners.
doesn't bother me at all. taking a break, Mom. It's like this every night, Jean. You fiddle-faddle your time away. It's a wonder to me you ever get anything done. Always putting things off until the last minute. Oh, I do get things done, though, don't I? Just by the skin of your teeth and with all of us helping. Now get to work. I'll expect to see all this homework finished by 9.30. All right, Mom. Hi, Jean. Hi, Marge. Finish all your homework? No, not quite. I'll finish it during first hour history class. Miss Jones will just think of taking notes. But, Jean, there were only ten words to define. I finished mine in practice. Say, Marge, didn't Mr. Brown say he'd post the list of new class officers this morning? I think so. We voted yesterday morning, so they should be ready by today. Gee, I wish I knew who was elected. Wish that bus would hurry. Golly, Marge, I'm sorry you didn't get elected. Oh, that's all right. Jean will make a good social chairman. She's got lots of good ideas. Yeah, but she never sees things through. She was chairman of the class assembly last year, and it was one of the best we ever had. Sure, I remember. We did everything at the last minute. Just the same, it was good. That was just luck. Besides, we're all so mad we did everything we could think of to make it good. Marge, didn't any of you girls ever tell Jean about Promising so much and then waiting until the last minute to get started? Oh, yes. We told her. She said it was a good idea and then went right on doing like she always does. What a girl. Here are the plans for the decorations. So They're real simple and we'll only need the gym the night before the party. In fact, if we start to decorate at 6.30 sharp, we'll be all through by 8.30. Let me see it, Jean. See? She's really on the ball this time. You just wait. We still have a whole month to go. I have a list of all the crepe paper and stuff we need. I'll bring them the night we decorate. Uh-oh, here it comes. Look, Jean, this decoration stuff is simple enough, but there's more to it than just talking about it. Maybe you ought to point some committees to hell. Yeah, yeah that's right. Right. What about yeah. reserving the gym? What about refreshments? We'll need to eat. Yeah. Fine, yeah. yeah. well, yeah. yeah. kids. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. Jim, you're in charge of getting wire for decorations, OK? OK. Marge, will you point a committee and make the invitations and programs for the dance? And Frank, you'll be business manager and sell the ticket. Oh. <laughs> Let's see. Decorations. I'd like to shop for the crepe paper myself. I know just the colors I want. And in the morning, I'll see Mr. Brown about the gym. And tonight, I'll make a list of the refreshments the committee is to arrange for. But, Jean... That's still too much for you to do by yourself. Why won't you appoint some more people to help you? Oh, don't worry, Marge. There's no hurry. I'll get it done. I move we adjourn to the drugstore. Come on, yeah. 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 I'll see you later. Okay. Mr. Brown, I was just coming to see you. And I was just coming to see you, Jean. I wanted to see you about getting the gym for Friday night and Saturday, the day of our party. Well, Jean, you should have seen me about that some time ago. You mean we can't have it? Well, fortunately for you, Jim saw me about it a few days ago, so I did reserve the gym for the class. But as chairman of that committee, Jean, you should have seen me about that reservation at least a month ago. I'm sorry, Mr. Brown. But, gee, with all the tests and everything, I just didn't have time to. Well, I hope you aren't putting off many more of your responsibilities, because you haven't much time left. Oh, yes, sir. I know that. 
I'm going downtown right after school tonight and get the decorations and... Jean, did you ever try making a list like this of the things you have to do and the time you have to do them in and then try sticking with the list? Oh, sure, Mr. Brown. That's a good idea. Well, thanks for reserving the gym for us. I've got to go now. Bye. Goodbye. Hi, Alice. Say, I've got the Garibius new record I want you to hear. Come on over after school and we'll play it. I'm sorry, Mrs. Hill, but I just don't know what Jean has done about refreshments for the party. You know, Mrs. Nelson, I work during the day, and I would like to know what Martha is to bring so that I can prepare it the evening before and get it out of the way. I understand, Mrs. Hill, and I'll talk to Jean and have her get in touch with you this evening. Thanks for calling. Jean, come here a moment, please. Later, Mom. I'm supposed to meet the kids in a few minutes. Jean. But, Mom. Jean. All right, I'm coming. What do you want, Mom? Jean, Mrs. Hill just called, and she said that you told Martha that she was to bring part of the refreshments for the party. Well, sure. All of the kids are supposed to bring something. But what are they to bring? They don't know. Well, golly, this is only Thursday, Mom, and the party isn't until Saturday. Jean, you be sure and call Mrs. Hill today and let her know what Martha is to bring to the party. Okay. Oh, and Mom, could you run downtown today and get these things for me? They're for decorations. I'd go myself, only I have to get some book reports for Miss Simmons, and it's the last day. I can't go until tomorrow, Jean. I'm having book club here this afternoon, but if it's just odds and ends. Jean Nelson, this is terrible. You couldn't possibly get all these things in one afternoon. But Jean, Mom, we've got to decorate tomorrow night. Oh, well, I guess I'll have to see if I can go myself tonight before the stores close, or tomorrow before we decorate. Jean... I just can't understand you. Why do you always put off everything till the last minute? Well, I couldn't help it, Mom. There are just so many things to do, and... Oh, there's Marge. Bye now. Don't worry. I'll get everything done. I'll take care of everything, Jean said. At the time, she really meant it. But when she tried to call Martha's mother about the cookies, the line was busy. And when she tried to get to town that afternoon, there were some other things she needed, and the stores closed before she could buy the materials for the decorations. Anyway, there's still tomorrow. She'll have to work hard, skip some other things she ought to do, but Jean works well under pressure. Yes, there's still tomorrow. And the hints the others gave her? Marge, advising her to assign some of the work to a committee and not try to do so much herself. Mr. Brown suggesting she make a list of the things she had to do and the time she had to do them in. Jim wanting her to get the job started weeks ahead while she still had time to get it finished. Yes, Jean had plenty of hints on how to get things done. And she had good intentions. But something always happened to keep her from making use of their advice. So Jean is polishing her nails. They'll look nice for the party tomorrow. I told you so. I told you'd be like this. Now, Jim, there's no use getting upset about it. Well, my mother's upset, and I don't blame her. Jean didn't tell me till today what I was supposed to bring for refreshment, and now Mom has to stay home from work and make cookies. Yeah, we almost didn't get the jam either. Did you hear about that one? Yeah. Now listen, this won't help. There's still time to make this a good party. Jean will be here in a few minutes with the decorations. And well, then... she's 15 minutes late already. Oh, what a chairman. Oh. Oh. Hi. Here, let me help you. Gosh, that doesn't look like much crepe paper. Well, it isn't exactly what I had in mind, but... What do you mean it isn't exactly what you had in mind? Now, wait a minute, Jim. I have been waiting. We've all been waiting for two months. Why don't you have enough crepe paper? And why didn't you tell the kids about the refreshments? And why did you wait until the last minute to reserve the gym? I... I've been so busy, I... Busy, my foot. You just put it off like you always do. Jim, blaming Jean isn't going to help now. I know, but I'm going to tell Jean something she should have been told a long time ago. Now listen, Jean, it's okay with me if you get your homework in at the last minute. That's your business. 
But when you ruin the whole class party just because you keep putting things off, none of us like it. Let me tell you something else. Well, that's Gene's story. Always putting things off. Procrastination, it's called. Can you see how procrastination affected Jean, her friends, their party? How could Jean manage her time better? Remember the hints some of the others gave her? Could you use them to good advantage? Did Jean? What do you think? <laughs> The sort of dancing which most of us are familiar with is called round or social dancing. Actually, square dancing is a much more social affair, as we'll see when the caller gets this group organized. All join hands in circle to the left. All of the center and back you go. All of the center and back once more. Gentlemen, dance with the lady on your left. You circle four, you circle four. A circle eight, circle eight. All of the center and hands up high. And swing your partners all. Element lift for the old lift hand, element lift and a little lift friend. Around that circle, hand over hand, you plant your tater in the sandy land. To meet your honey and promenade, promenade it till you come straight. The first couple balance, the first Now let's play. watch a student group work out some of the patterns of the and square dance with a traditional play. set of four couples. Each couple stands on one side of an imaginary ten-foot square. The couple facing the orchestra is known as the head or first couple. To their right is the second couple. The third couple stands opposite the first. And here is the home station of the fourth couple. A gentleman always has his partner on his right. The call is, honor your partner. Now it's honor your corner. Then swing your partner. For the swing, partners face each other. Each takes a short step sideways with the left foot. The gentleman's right hand supports the lady in the small of her back. Her right hand lies palm down in his left. And her left hand rests on the upper part of his right arm. Their hips are almost touching. Right feet side by side as they swing around, taking short, quick steps. This walk step for beginners is simple and effective. Some dancers do a buzz step by pushing downward and backward with the toe of the left foot while pivoting on the right. The Alaman left is a movement repeated many times during an evening of square dancing. On the call, Alaman left, gentleman and corner lady face each other and join left hands like this. Then they walk once around each other, counterclockwise, to their original home position. Here's the Alaman left again with the whole square. At the end of this movement, partners are facing each other. So now since left hands are joined, it's natural to extend right hand to partner and join hands at the call, grand right and left. Partners pass right shoulder to right shoulder as they start around the circle. The gentleman takes the left hand of the next lady in his left hand and they pass to the left of each other. And so on until he meets his partner halfway around with his right hand in her right. She reverses direction, and like a pair of skaters, they join left hands underneath right. The promenade is simply a graceful walk or two-step to music. Back at home stations, partners face each other. Ladies curtsy, gentlemen bow. Now with music, let's put these fundamentals together in a simple square dance figure. Honor your partner. Honor your corner. Now swing your partners all. Element left. Grand right and left. You meet your partner. 
partner and halfway around and promenade her home. Now without music, let's see how couples go visiting. On the call, first and third couples promenade the outside ring. These couples walk around outside the set, while the other couples, having taken two short steps to the center, remain until both visiting couples have passed, then return to station and turn to receive their visitors. Now it's right and left through with the couples you meet. The two couples exchange places, turn, and return to position on the call right and left back. The next call may be two ladies chain, followed by a chain right back. In the right and left through, each gentleman passes his lady through the opposite couple. Then partners join hands in this manner as he turns her in place. The ladies pass each other by left shoulders and then move forward on the pivot as the gentlemen turn backwards. For the two ladies chain, the ladies pass in the center and join left hands with the opposite gents who turn them in place as before. The call chain right back is executed in the same way and returns the couples to a starting position. Let's watch the two ladies from above. Notice that they join right hands for a moment as they pass in the center. And after passing, they join left hands, then right hands with the gentleman for the turn. The next call might be, four hands up and around we go, halfway around and a dozy do All drop hands. Gentleman passes his partner through the opposite couple while he moves past the opposite lady, right shoulder to right shoulder. Partners join left hands. Moving counterclockwise, the lady encircles the gentleman halfway around. The gentlemen pass right shoulders to each other. Each takes the opposite lady with the right hand and drops his partner's left hand. Now the lady encircles the opposite gentleman a full turn around, still counterclockwise. She drops his hand and takes her partner's left hand. Finally, the gentlemen turn their partners in place. Now keep your eye on one of the dancers as they go through another dozy do. Four hands up and around we go, halfway around in a dozy do. Hurry up, gents, and don't be slow. One more change, and home you go. Now, slowly again. Each gentleman passes his partner through the opposite couple. Partners join left hands, and the lady moves halfway around her partner. Gentlemen pass right shoulder to right shoulder each taking the opposite lady's right hand and dropping his partner's left hand. Now each lady turns completely around the opposite gentleman, drops his hand, and takes her partner's left hand. To complete the dozy do, gentlemen turn their partners in place. Now let's put these steps together to music. First and third, couple balance and swing. And promenade the outside ring, the outside ring, the outside ring. Right and left through with a couple you meet. Right and left back. Two ladies chain. Chain right back, chain right back. Four hands up and around we go, and a halfway round a don't see do. Hurry up, gents, and don't be slow. One more change, and home you go, and home you be, and everybody swing. Now let's put some of these square dance fundamentals together with a pattern of a traditional square dance, such as take a little peek. All eight balance, all eight swing. Element left for the oop lift, and the element left to right and left brand. A barber, barber, shave a pig. How many hairs to make a wig? Four and twenty, that's enough to give the barber a pinch of snuff and promenade your promenade. The first little couple bounce and swing the first couple swing, and you lead right off to the right of the ring. Around that couple, take a little peek, back to the center, you swing your swing. 
fire on the couple, seek once more, back to the center and you swing all four. All in the pen round to go and a half way round, and don't seem to when the just come through with a heel and toe and a heel and toe and the gals you know. One more do and on you go and around the couple, take a little peek, back to the center and you swing your sweep. Take a Little Peek is but one of many square dances which are made up of simple fundamentals, such as those we have seen demonstrated. With a little practice, anybody can join in the swing and follow the call, which continues long after we leave this session of the American Square Dance. Hear something? That depends on what it is. Of course, this is too good to keep. The other night I was out with Susan Harper. Susan? Yeah. Oh, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. You're not going steady with her, are you? No. Oh, well, in that case, uh, I stay at home from the library. Susan said that? Yeah, that's what oh, she said. No kidding. No. Yeah. Hey, there's the bell. We've got to go. Oh, I got it. Yeah. you guys. Uh, See you back later. later. I think he's just bragging. I doubt if he even had a date with Susan. Mel's the kind of guy who'd say anything to get some attention. See you at practice. This looks pretty good. Why don't we stay right here, Susan? Fine. Let's see. I'll ask you some questions from the end of the chapter. Then you can ask me some. Okay. Ready? Why is force a vector quantity? Because it has both magnitude and direction. That's right. Uh, now, uh, what instrument is normally used for measuring force? That's the next question, Dean. What instrument is normally used for measuring force? Susan. Did you go out with Mel Stone? Why, no. Why? I just wondered. He gave me a ride home from the library the other night. That's all. I don't like him very much. He kept telling me about all the girls he'd been out with. Here, I think you better ask me the questions for a while. Okay. Here's, here's one. Why don't you give me Newton's first law? Oh, I hope I can remember that. <laughs> Page 80. <laughs> you know you're boning up on the wrong thing, don't you? The test covers pages 70 to 80. That's what Miss Adams told us. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what she told everybody. But I took the test second hour this morning. I can tell you what the questions really are. I suppose the honor system applies to everybody but you and me. <laughs> okay, I was just trying to do a friend a favor. Excuse me, I see Marilyn, and I want to give her back the pen I borrowed. Bye, Dean. Bye, Susan. Boy, she sure is a nice-looking girl. She's nice, period. Oh, hey, Dean. Hey, Dean. Uh, how's football practice coming? We keep at it. Yeah, I was, I was watching scrimmage the other day. You, you look real good. You know that, that long pass you threw? Uh, how long was that? 35 yards? I don't know. It might have been. <laughs> yeah, it might have been a bandy caught it. You know, I'm, I'm crazy about football. Oh, I always have been. I used to play it all the time when I was little. Only thing, I stayed little. But, you know, I never got over liking it. 
I'll, I'll bet I know those plays as well as you guys do. I mean, I watch them that close. It's very interesting. Yeah, that's how come I can spot it when somebody's not doing his job, like, uh, like Andy not catching that pass. I wonder, I wonder if the coach knows Andy's breaking training. What do you say? Yeah, I thought you'd be interested. I thought you'd like to know where the foul up is, because you can't win that game with East High by yourself, and Andy's letting you down. Listen, Mel, you start spreading guff like that around, and I'll personally shut you up. It's not guff! It's true. The other night at 10.30, I saw him walking down Jefferson Street, and he's supposed to be in bed at 10. Yeah, as a matter of fact, that was the night I took Susan home from the library. Ask her if you don't believe me. How I was coming back from taking her home when I saw it. I think somebody ought to tell the coach, don't you? I told you, if you start spreading anything against oh, Andy... Me? Well, why should I tell the coach anything? It's your team. Oh, forget it. Okay, suit yourself. I still think you ought to tell him. Andy, we'll get it next time. Okay. Staying up late at night or something? Who told you? Nobody has to tell me your timing's all off. You act like you're all tired out or something. I get plenty of sleep. Look, Dean, I wasn't actually lying to you. I've got to do this. Believe me, I've got to. I don't get it. You know how important that game is, and you know what the training rules are. You bet I know how important that game is. And that's why I've been out walking late at night when nobody could see me. But I didn't lie. I get plenty of sleep. I take a nap every night, right after supper, before I start studying. I just go out for a walk just before I go to bed. But why? That bad knee. In the last game, I got it twisted. Just a little bit. But you know what the coach said. If it ever bothered me again, I was through. I just couldn't let him or anybody see me exercising it. I've had to do the work on my own. Andy, you might be hurting yourself. I think you better tell the team doctor. And get sidelined? No, sir. I know what I'm doing. Tomorrow's my last game, and I intend to play in it. The walking I've been doing is working. That knee's a lot better than it was three days ago. I still don't like it. I wish you'd tell the coach or the doctor. I'll be all right, Dean. Don't worry about me. You'd better worry about getting home and getting some sleep yourself. You didn't have a nap after supper. Wouldn't you know it? Mel Stone. Do you think he saw us? I think he saw us. <laughs> Third down on the 27-yard line. My, my, our All-American boys are getting clobbered. Pass interception and touchdown for East High by six. The kick was no good. Come on, gang, let's go! First and ten on the 
from the 35 yard line. The ball carrier was working, number 11. Hey, Sandy, he's hurt. Get up, Sandy. The injured player is Andy McGuire. Come on, gang, get with it. Come on, you guys. Quit moping. You're not hurt. Let's play ball. Is he hurt or just tired? I may have to ask that little question at the dance tonight. Golly, everybody's sort of quiet tonight. I guess they're tired after the game. Susan, you can't have much of a victory celebration without a victory. Don't feel badly. We all knew they were going to be tough. I just hope Andy isn't hurt seriously. Uh-oh, look who's coming. Oh, why, uh, why, why so glum, football hero? You, you didn't actually expect to win against guys who stick to training, did you? Mail. <laughs> That's right, Susan. You don't know about Dean and Andy, do you? I know they played a hard game against a team that was a lot bigger than they were. Let it go, Susan. It doesn't matter. Well, it does to me. You know what I think of you, Mel. I think you're just plain jealous of Dean and Andy. They're athletes, and they get along well in class. And everybody likes them. And you just can't stand that. Boy, she's, she's really sold on you, isn't she? I guess you didn't tell her where you were late last night. I guess she doesn't know why you played such a rotten game. Dean, what's he talking about? Why don't you get lost, Mel? What good is all this doing you anyway? Did you hear? The, the lady wants to know what I'm talking about. I don't want to hear it. <laughs> sure you do. You're just dying to hear it. As a matter of fact, everybody here is dying to hear it. Go ahead, make a speech, hero. Please, Mel. Are you going to speak up, Deanie boy, or shall I tell? You're bothering us. Beat it. In almost every group you find him, the troublemaker, who hurts himself and the others around him. What makes a person like Mel act the way he does? Is the group ever at fault? How would you cope with someone like Mel in your group? Could you help him? What do you think? charge and that your case be turned over to the juvenile authorities. Next case. Joseph Hastings, Your Honor. He lives out on the west side. Burglary. He was arrested last night after breaking into the Mackison warehouse on Walnut Street. Another boy got away. They are taking cigarettes and other merchandise. Here's the paper, sir. All right, officer. <clears throat> Sit down, Joe. Well. What happened to you? Want to tell me about it? Well, that's what I'm here for. What do you say, Joe? Well, uh, I don't know. It, 
Oh, it was a crazy thing to do. I don't know what to say. Well, then, suppose I ask you a few questions. You've never been in trouble before. That is, you've never been arrested before. That's right, Judge. What about your family, Joe? Your father and mother? Oh, they're swell. And they'll think that I'm... Now, don't oh. worry about that. Have you got any brothers or sisters? I have a kid sister, Betty. And you and Betty have good times together? Oh, sure. My folks are swell. They let Betty and I do just about what we please. Just about what you please, Joe? What do you mean by that? Well, we can go out when we want to and do what we want to and go wherever we want to. Just anything, Judge. Just anything, Joe? You mean you could go anywhere you wanted to? Anytime you wanted to? To any kind of a place? Even down to Mackeson's Warehouse for cigarettes? Oh, no, no, not that. We could do what we wanted to, but, well, but not that. Do you smoke, Joe? Well, my dad does, and he's all right. Are you on the school team? No, I, I didn't make it. The fellows on the team smoke? Oh, no, the coach won't let them. But you do, Joe. Well, all the fellows do. All the fellows who can't make the team. Yes, Judge, I, I guess you can't smoke and win. But uh, why did you go to the warehouse, Joe? Well, we, we just didn't have anything to do or something. I, oh, I don't know, Judge. All right, Joe. <clears throat> and now, um, what about school? Have you been attending regularly? Oh, playing hooky, eh? With whom? Come on, tell me about it. Well, I have a pal. He's in my class, and we never have a place to go. So we meet after school, and we just sort of hang around together. Oh, Bob is smart. He's been around and knows a couple of things. He's the only guy I know who is a pal. But what about your dad, Joe? Well, he's all right. But with Bob, it's different. He understands. Oh, we're pals, Judge. Is that why you were both out there at the warehouse? Who said he was there? I never did. Oh, what if we did smoke? What if we did have a beer? Oh, so you had some beer. You mean that... Before you went out to the warehouse. Well, Judge, Bob and I didn't mean any harm. We had a couple of beers at a tavern and ran out of cigarettes. Bob said he knew where to get some, so just left. We went down to the Mackinson warehouse and helped ourselves to cigarettes. But just as we were coming out of the place, they caught us. Bob, I mean my pal, he got away. But they caught me. Well, Joe, by catching you this first time, it may never happen again. Now, just a minute. I've asked your parents to come down here. They're in the waiting room now. They're awfully unhappy about this. Hey, John, will you ask Mr. and Mrs. Hastings to step in here, please? Yes, sir. Mr. and Mrs. Hastings, won't you sit down, please? But the object of the juvenile court is to give help in cases like this. About this son of yours. He's a good boy. Why do you suppose he's been playing hooky from school? What? He has? Joe? What? Now, just a minute. You act as if Joe's playing hooky from school were on trial here, but it's not. That's one thing. Joe's here on a charge of burglary, and that's quite a different matter. You didn't know that he'd played hooky from school, and you didn't know that he'd robbed a warehouse. Joe didn't become a burglar suddenly. 
Bob and the places they went together had something to do with it. Why did he go to those places? Did you know where he was going? So long, folks. See you later. And your daughter? Do you know where she goes? Bye, Mother. I'm going out now. Are they scouts? Do they go to Sunday school? What do scouts have to do with this? And Sunday school. In all my experience, I've had no boy scouts and no girl scouts in my court. And what's more, no young people who attend Sunday school regularly were ever brought in here. Why, Judge, I never realized the importance of religious training. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt... I haven't said those for a long time. I agree with J. Edgar Hoover that every child should be taught the Golden Rule. And I might add the Ten Commandments and how they apply in our modern life. Oh, Judge, we thought we were doing everything we could to make them happy. They have their friends in a couple times a year. We try to make them all feel at home. We serve beer. That's so much better than going to the taverns. Mrs. Hastings, I assure you, I know what you mean. You have only the thought of keeping your children near you, in the home. But what you both forget is, it's not where you drink, but what you drink that counts. In your living room or in any public place, no matter what you call it, alcohol is alcohol, whether it's in beer, wine, or whiskey. But beer never hurt anyone. The National Safety Council has found that the amount of alcohol in a glass or two of beer is enough to interfere with good judgment and make some safe drivers. In the same way it interferes with and changes everyday judgments and makes people do things they wouldn't otherwise do. Such as Joe going down to that warehouse. He knew that was wrong. And what about your daughter? I don't want Betty in here, too. I never thought beer hurt me any. We thought we were doing right. You have a responsibility for Joe and Betty. You have a good home. You can give them every opportunity. Crime begins in little things. For instance, I recall at a high school tournament, visiting students did $300 damage to furniture. They forgot good manners. They didn't know the golden rule. Lack of respect for the rights of others leads to crimes like stealing. Judge, what about our children today? What more can we do? Young people don't want to get into trouble. They want fun and companionship. A boy like Joe isn't really underneath a bad youth. Often, he's very good. He has courage, imagination, sensitivity. You? Young people everywhere bubble with ideas. In many places, they have organized to express ideas, to better their own communities, their own lives. Youth is active, eager to learn, eager to accomplish, to do things for itself. There are ways they may be helped. There are many existing agencies that can assist youth in its search for wholesome, hearty activities. In the church, with its teachings and its leadership, with its activities, its opportunities, youth seeks and finds those things it expects and wants of the world. Do you know that J. Edgar Hoover says that there would be practically no crime among youth if young people attended Sunday school regularly during their formative years? An important every day to every youth is his home. In the home, in every home, the proper influence, the good example must be present. That's the parent's job, your job. The children should have in the home the right environment and example to learn good manners and develop good habits. It's the parent's job to ensure for the home those responsibilities and activities that will make fine characters. The home is the center of the child's life. In fairness to them, it should be morally and socially rich.
So, you see, it's up to all of us, to you and to me, to adults and youth, you can send Joe and Betty safely forth into the world. Youth asks only a chance. It wants to achieve. It is justly proud and hopeful and courageous. Youth holds its head high. It looks to a better world. I think I know what you mean now, Judge. John, now that we have a plan, we can really make a home. Well, with this new outlook, you can give Joe and Betty a better opportunity in life. I'm going to give you a chance to make Joe's life a little better. I'm going to return him to your custody on probation. But first, I want to talk to him alone. He'll meet you in the outer office in a few minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge. Now, Joe, this is just between us. Before you started for the Magazine Warehouse, you had some beer. That's right, isn't it? Yes, sir. That's one reason why you did it, Joe. The alcohol in the beer dulls your judgment. And you did what otherwise you would have known to be wrong. Keep away from it. It'll never help you. It's an enemy. Never a friend. What's that, Joe? Well, it's a head. The brain. Yes. And that's what goes wrong with you when you take a drink. Your brain goes wrong, your thinking goes wrong, and you go wrong. It may take only one drink, Joe, and you lose your sense of caution. Your judgment is impaired. You just lose all the way around. Alcohol is not a stimulant. It's a narcotic. It dulls the brain. You've had Shakespeare in school, haven't you? Yeah, some. Well, if you don't remember anything else of his, remember this. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Those friends thou hast and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each new hatched, unfledged comrade. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Neither a borrower nor a lender be, for loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. And now, Joe, so long. Remember that. To thine own self be true. I'm going to make a new start, Judge. Thanks for putting me on the right track. Oh, just fine, sir. Good. You look it. And do you remember what I told you? Well, uh, I've learned a lot from what you've said, Judge. To thine own self be true. I'll never forget that. 
I'm off cigarettes and beer forever. I'm glad to hear that, Joe. You've learned the hard way. I hope others don't have to, sir. Thanks to you, Judge, home is a different place. I'm a different fellow. Well, you proved yourself. Your probation has ended. Good luck. Goodbye, sir. And thanks again. You know, seeing that boy walk out of here and knowing the kind of lad he is, well, it makes you feel kind of warm and happy inside. Like saving a life. He can't be there anymore. He just checked out. He got his work permit, man. Yet yeah, you'll be sorry. Sorry? He's got a vacation for life. Man, I, I wish I could work out with you right now. Ah, uh, you'll make it. It's just a matter of time. Doug, when will I see you? He's not going into outer space. He's just blasted out of school. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Come on, Slade. See you tonight, Doug. Really great, man. I'll call you. First steady job, Pop. I remember how it was. Yeah? Mr. Willard from the school. He called me. Yeah? He's got some idea, maybe it's not the right thing. <sighs> oh, Mr. Willard. What does he know about me? What does he know about work? Look at you. Gee, you didn't even get past the sixth grade. You're doing great. Good job. Same place all your life. That's important, Pop. You told me that. Think we should talk some more? Later, when the kids are in bed? Well, I don't know, uh, Pop. Uh, Bonnie said I could stop by a while uh, after homework's finished. Oh, well. Man, that kid stuff's all behind me now. To tell you the truth, Doug, I don't mind homework. I even like school. Bonnie, it is different with a girl. I don't see the difference. You don't? No, I think lots of boys like school. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you still think it's the right thing? Yeah. Like that part-time job I had last summer. Look what it got me. Think of what a full-time job's gonna mean. No more part-time life for me, Bonnie. I hope so, Dad. I'm gonna move out, too. Give my kid brothers more room, as soon as I can. My family can have back the living room. Bonnie? <sighs> yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Look how many men in charge of big companies started this way. Can't wait forever, can you? 
I guess your mom and me, we just hate to see you growing up so fast, that's all. The job's right for me. Okay, Doug. We trust you. Just hope it's the right thing. Pop, it's like I'm alive. Like I'm finally waking up. something is. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, I'm going to buy you guys a sandwich from work, huh? Train check. Uh, Gotta get home and beat the books. English test tomorrow. Yeah, me too. We got this... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> we got this new math teacher, you know? You mean Albert's a young guy? He's really oh, pushing he's us. Great. It's like learning a story. They finally invented a way to inject math into your bloodstream. The square of the iPhone! <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Sounds crazy. Well, we'll see you, man, right? Thanks a lot, you guys, huh? That's okay. Looks good on you. See ya. <laughs> How is it down there, Doug? Where? The job, where you work. Oh, great. Nice guys, huh? Yeah. Nice place to work, clean and nice? Yeah, I guess. Sure got it made. Well, just a job. Huh? And this room, a man to have a room all of your own. Yeah. I gotta talk to my father and mother about quitting. He works nights and she works days, busy with all the kids. <laughs> I can never get the two of them together at the same time. You will, it'll happen. Nah, I don't know. Got an uncle, keeps talking about college for me, but he doesn't understand. No. You know, when we first came to the city, I was oh, maybe four years old. This uncle, he gave to me a radio tube, burned out one. But I never had such a thing before. I, I carried it in my pocket, slept with it at night under my pillow. And it glowed, no kidding, it was alive. I still got it. But you got a lot of other ones, too. Got a lot of equipment. Man, if I could get a job in electronics. That's not for me. Crummy leftover jobs, that's what I'll get. Something I have to live with. Oh, come on. I think it's better if I take what I can get. It's up to you. Just thinking about it makes me light up like that old radio tube. You need a soda or something. You sound a little empty in the head. So just for that, I take a rain check, too. Uh, anyway, I have to go home and... See you, man. Yeah, I'll see you. The job's going fine. Oh, it's a little monotonous, that's all. Yeah. But I'm looking around in my lunch hour for something better. You used to talk this way about schoolwork, too. Maybe. But now I can choose. Hi, Tony. Fine. Is he working? Oh, off and on. Still got to get married? I think so, yeah. So what are you doing around here, anyway? When you quit school last year, didn't you get a job in an office? For a while, but, well, you know me in English class. Well, those guys in the offices. They can't spell either. 
So they expect me to do all the spelling for them. It's a real kooky world, you know? Begin retraining our older men in the operating procedures of the new Milo automatic sorting and filing machine. As a result, we will be forced immediately to let men go in order of seniority. I wish Doug hadn't just dived out of here. I think we could have worked out different courses. Well, Carlos says Doug's doing great. Keeps changing from one job to another. Yes, I know. He's been in here for work permits. According to Carlos, Doug's really getting someplace. Well, who knows? Could be. Excuse me, sir. Sure, Bonnie. <laughs> Fellas, you have two minutes to finish those applications. What would you say if you got a teacher who instead said, I don't care how you write, but be proud of what you write? We may have something. You out of high school? Yes, sir. Graduate? Well, no, uh, not, not exactly. Oh, no point in filling this out. Come back in about three weeks. Mr. Sloan? We may be putting some extra wrappers on then. a disc to set your feet a dance. My folks place. A real busy character, huh? What are you gonna do with all that bread you're making? Gonna get a new car? I don't know. 
What a life, huh? Come and go when you want to. <laughs> hey, man, we better get back to the floor before these bunnies hop away from us. Oh, come on. Hey, Doug, it's great to see you. I'll see you, man. I gotta get going, Carlos. I finally got my father and mother together. It's great. Let's talk about it tomorrow, huh? Goodbye, Linda. Doug Miller. How are you? Hi, Mr. Willard. Oh, uh, this is Mrs. Willard. Good evening, Doug. Just, uh, looking in at the dance. How's your family? Your father? Real fine, thanks. Still working at the, um, Sh Shilton plant, like always. Are you still at Bolton's? No. I got something better coming up. That's great. I've been having some talks with Carlos. He wants to pull out, start working too. Yeah, I know. Doug. If that new job doesn't work out, why don't you drop by the State Employment Service? Ask for Ralph Norman. Yeah, sure. You'll like him. He's been out here working with our guidance program. Yeah? Talk with him. Tell him I sent you. He'll have some ideas. Okay, thanks. Doug? I'll tell him you'll drop around. Good night, Doug. Nice meeting you. I see you worked at a filling station last summer. How'd you like it? I, uh, like the times I had a, uh, chance to, uh, help out with the motor. I like cars. Always have, Mr. Norman. Like to fix things, huh? Sure. Try to get a job in a garage? Sometimes one thing. Now even those guys want to, you know. Doug, if you had a completely free choice, what would you really like to do in life? Get a job like my father. He's quite a guy, huh? 20 years on the same job. How often have you talked to Mr. Woolard? A couple of times, maybe, when he called me in. Why should I talk to him? I wasn't headed for college. Ah, oh, come on, Doug. You got the wrong idea. Mr. Woolard is there for everybody. Yeah? We've been working with him to try to help you kids find the area in which you have talent. Things you can do that maybe you never even thought about, don't even know about. We know jobs. We know what the employer says he needs. Now, our job is to help you see where you fit. The things that you have to do nowadays to make yourself fit. I know where I fit, Mr. Norman. I know what I want. All my life, I've only wanted to get out of school and work like my father and his father. What's so wrong about that? Times are changing, Doug. It's different now. All right. I know you need a job. Here's a life insurance company. They need men. Now, the work's not going to be any better than your other jobs. But it'll give you some money. It'll fill in. Thanks. Think about what I said. I want to see you again. Thanks a lot. Doug had some big layoffs at the plant. Just doing this to fill in, keep some money coming.
just temporary. Doug, it wasn't just your father they let go. About a quarter of their workforce. It was a tough decision. But to stay competitive, they had to modernize. Well, what's going to happen? How can they all live on messengers' pay? Well, we're working with Sheldon's personnel department. We're trying to see which people can be moved up to new jobs. What new training might help. Yeah, I suppose you want my dad to go back to school, too. You never stop going to school. You always go on learning, especially now. Today, education is the key. If you want any doors to open tomorrow, that's why we worry about you dropouts. I'm not a dropout. I just left school. Doug, we try to line up places to send you for work. We do. We used to find jobs for kids as elevator operators. But look at your new buildings today. Automatic elevators. Even the old buildings. Sure, there are new jobs. Interesting jobs. Here, look. Sixty different jobs, all wide open and waiting. But they all want a high school education. They all want to see that lousy piece of paper. You're darn right. But there's more to it than just that. I mean, you can't just walk around dressed in a high school diploma and expect a big glad hand to reach out for you. The men who do the hiring today look behind the diploma at you. Now, you gain an awful lot in those extra couple of years it takes to earn that piece of paper. Just waste time. No, no. In the shop, you work with your hands. In math, you work with your head. In English or whatever. Just being there for two more years, learning to concentrate, to work in details, to finish a job. Why should employers take on kids who can't even finish one job? One thing you can do in this changing labor market, and that is to prepare yourself. Figure out where you want to go, what exists for you, what you want. I want a job. We can aim you at something specific, Doug, along with part-time schooling. Take this booklet home. Take your time, study it, think about it. I have no time, Mr. Norman. I need a job. You want to spend the rest of your life in some kind of a job that All right. All right. I have nothing today. Come back tomorrow morning at 10. I may have something. Cigarette for me? Yeah. But it just doesn't pay off anymore, Carlos, to leave school like this. I have my parents' permission. Please let me arrange a part-time job, along with some classes. You've got a great potential, but not this way. Please, Mr. Willard, I have to go all the way now. Look at Doug. He said at the Harmon plant, Carlos, this is the time not to play follow the leader. Hey, we're going to see about a job. Anybody interested? Where? Harmon plant. I hear they're hiring. No, man, I got a practice session. Maybe we'll run into Doug. Come on. If you do, say hello to him, huh? Don't bother the kid, we're not hiring him.
job isn't just a job anymore. The whole crazy thing is more complicated. It seems so simple. No, you just run around back and forth like one of those rats and one of those things at the lab at school. You don't know, Carlos. Nobody knows until you're on the outside. I know, dog. I just have to look at my father and his job. And I just have to look in the mirror every day, and I know. So don't you have to be even better prepared? To run into walls. Ah, uh, you're an idiot, Carlos. You like school. See. Si. See, so you're an idiot, see? Si? Now look, you have to become what you want to become. Why do you have to be caught like your father? Look at me. I'm what my father is. Both of us. It's really crazy. Sometimes you have no choice. You always have a choice. Maybe the choice is a lousy, but there's always something to choose. I had an offer, man. Didn't need a high school education. Work for a mob. Rob. Steal. You did that. No, I, no, but I had the choice. And it's a pretty lousy choice between doing that and moving garbage in a plant. And that's what it adds up to for me and my father. So if you quit, why should it be any different for you? It could be. How do you know? How do you know? Go ask Mr. Willard. Go down to the employment service and ask Mr. Norman. They know. Unskilled jobs are drying up and getting duller. You don't have a high school education, you dry up with them and you get duller and duller. I was wrong, Carlos. You don't have to be a jerk, too. Do better than your father. You're a guy who can. It's you, man. What's inside you? What do you want to do? Play with burnt out radio tubes all your life? Then you come back with me. Why not? You are not, you're not such an old man. Come back with me. That's a simple choice. Not anymore, Carlos. Not for me. I'm not sure I have the guts. or lesser degree, we are all products of our environment. What we do, what we think, and how we feel is very largely determined by our past experience. Robert, John, Paul, and Bill are no different than the rest. We all need social approval, recognition, and we fight against rejection. In every waking hour of our lives, we are faced with decisions. The moment of decision is the span taken while we are making up our mind. During that period, we weigh the factors involved. Sometimes it takes only a second, sometimes hours, days, or even weeks. But that decision is always our own, and if it is an important one, 
It may affect our whole future, even our life. For Robert, John, Paul, and Bill, the moment of decision is not far off. Temptation is waiting in the form of a sleek bronze convertible. It's already caught your attention, hasn't it, boys? The desire to be mobile, to move swiftly, is part of being young. Speed is a dimension best understood by youth. Up to now, the desire is only a projection of your imagination. But in a moment, Paul will notice something that will change all that. Now the opportunity is there. All you have to do is climb in and drive off. Now you're each faced with a decision, one that could change your life. Each of you, because of your background, will bring a predisposition that will color your decision. You know what you are contemplating is against the law. It's not a childish prank or a misdemeanor, it's a felony. Grand theft auto. So this is a gamble, a big gamble, the biggest you may ever make. For each of you, the decision will be colored by many things. For John, it will be his need for recognition. You'll assume the role of leader, won't you, John? You continually force yourself to compete, to win. These are good qualities when channeled correctly. But what you are now considering is far from a worthwhile project. But your need for recognition may overweigh your common sense as it has in the past. You aren't able to find the recognition you think you deserve at home. Your parents are always saying, why, you can't do that, John, you're too young. Oh, what a stupid thing to say. You'll know better when you grow up. But as you grew up, the vicious child-parent cycle began. Neither you nor your parents were probably aware when it began. But remember the time when you were picked up for curfew and your father was hauled into court? Was he sore? You really didn't think it was your fault. At least you didn't do it deliberately. But that didn't make any difference to your father. You got recognition all right. Maybe not the kind you thought you deserved, but it was recognition. And you found that by getting into trouble, you were a factor to be considered. And consciously or subconsciously, you got into more and more trouble. Then you found that by taking chances, you got the approval of your group. The bigger the chance, the more approval. You became the leader, and the group looked up to you because you had heart, as they called it. Again, you've got to show you've got guts. Show that you can be the leader. Your moment of decision is at hand. You weigh the odds against getting caught. Though you know you're wrong, your emotional need for recognition outweighs your good sense. Another chance to prove yourself. You make up your mind. Come on, Paul, let's go. So now, Paul, it's up to you. Your moment of decision has arrived. Your fight is against rejection. You know what John has suggested is dangerous. The chances of being caught are great. Your folks would be furious if they knew you were even contemplating such an action. But after all, you don't care. They don't love you anyway. Or at least that's what you think. They're always on your back about something. They don't like the way you keep your room. Your hair is too long. No son of mine is gonna live like some beatnik. You've heard it a million times. When did it all start? Who knows? Maybe it was when Jerry was a baby and you tried to help. You didn't know that in the few minutes it took to go to the store to get some airplane cement, a baby could almost strangle himself in his own bedclothes. Well, he didn't die, so what was all the fuss about? Your mother frantic, your father yelling? You didn't stop to think your parents had been scared half to death. You were angry. You wanted to strike back. It all seemed so unfair. And as time went on, you got back at them by being bad. You're rejected at home, or so you think. Well, you won't be rejected by your group, not at any price. You make your decision. Now, Bill, it's up to you. You're not unlike the others. You need social approval, recognition, and you'll fight against rejection. But you also know the gamble you're about to take. You ask the question, Am I willing to pay the price if I get caught? That's a tough one, isn't it? Like all the others, your decision will be colored by the past. Growing up is never easy. Both your parents have worked as long as you can remember. 
Even so, there never seemed to be enough money for the things you wanted. You always spent too much time alone. And then last summer, you had a chance to go on a fishing trip with a gang. But you didn't have a rod and reel. And when you asked your dad, he said, well, I'm sorry, son, I, I just don't have the cash. Why don't you go get a job after school? But there wasn't time, and you stole a rod and reel. Your father found out and raised Cain. But he also talked with you and showed you where you were wrong. Then he took you back to the sporting goods store where you had stolen the equipment. The manager listened, and he and your dad worked it out. The rod and reel were put aside, and you were to get a part-time job. You didn't go fishing that weekend, but not long after when the rod and reel were paid for, you did go. You and your father went together, and you gained respect for your father and yourself. He helped you with that decision. Now this one is on you. But you're better equipped than you were to weigh the odds. And when you ask yourself the question, am I willing to pay the price if I lose, you know you're not. You see the hostility begin. Okay, chicken. Bill was smart and you know it, but he's gone and branded chicken. How badly do you need social approval? There's no question in your mind about right and wrong. You know it's wrong, but your need to belong is great. It's always seemed an uphill fight to you. How many times have you heard your parents call as you left the house with a gang? Be careful, dear, have a good time, but don't get into trouble. Then the jeers and laughter. At first you tried to go along with your parents but you lost the respect of your friends. It was a hard fight to get it back and you had to take a lot of chances to do it. Just like the chance you'll have to take now if you want to belong. Chicken, that's a stigma that wouldn't be easy to overcome. You can't face that word, can you? It's your decision and your life and you could face it if you tried, but you're not ready to try. You've all made your decisions now, three to one. Only one of you squarely faced up to the big question, am I willing to take the punishment if I get caught? All of you sidestepped that question except Bill. You think you'll make it, so you try. But in the whirlwind of events that follow, the stolen car is spotted and the police give chase. to stop and tell them it was only a prank, that you knew better. But even now, you're not willing to face up to reality, and you try your next big gamble. You try to outrun them. But fate steps in and you're caught. Now the cards are squarely on the table. You've lost the gamble, and you find you're not willing to face the punishment. needs seem small against the possibility of going to prison. Suddenly you realize what you knew all along. The decision was your very own. And while it may have been colored by your background, you and you alone had to make the choice. There will be other decisions in the future. And though you handle this one badly, if you make an effort to understand the reason for making it the way you did, you may yet learn to make wise decisions before it's too late.